The following podcast is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. I'm trying to sneak Christianity back into Christendom. You're explaining my story better than I can explain it. (laughs) Your listeners right now are getting an absolute exclusive. That is a great point. Very good point. Over 90% of the faculties in most of our universities are of one political opinion, and they will not tolerate anybody coming into lecture who has a different view. The church is not a pacifist entity. We have centuries of just war theory that have been laid down for us. A very common reason for turning away from religion is you get a half-truth. You get the bad news without the good news. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, We ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, that we might hear your voice and obey your command. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord, and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, this is a non-standard week in the life of the Church in in America, which means it's a non-standard week for the Catholic Current. In addition to our regularly scheduled guests, we're going to dedicate the first segment to live reports from the Bishop's Meeting in Baltimore. Joining us today for... a, a, a. a returning guest is Michael Hitchborn of the Lepanto Institute, calling in live from Baltimore. Michael, welcome back to the Catholic Current. Thanks so, th- thanks so much for having me. It's uh, cold out here, so if I shiver a little bit, <laughs> you'll understand. <laughs> well, that, that ends a certain degree of authenticity and, and realism to the proceedings. Uh, now, Michael, the, uh, the, the day kicked off a little bit with an unexpected message. Can you tell us about it, please? Sure did. So uh, just before the bishops were getting ready to start their first session, Cardinal DiNardo announced to uh, the bishops there that they were not going to be deliberating and voting on two propositions regarding clerical sex abuse, uh, one pertaining to uh, the kind of authority that the bishops would have in, in, in order to uh, fraternally correct one another, and the other in the establishment of a lay uh, board to oversee any kind of investigation into clerical sex abuse. Uh, This directive apparently came down straight from Pope Francis himself, and um, in the room were absolutely shocked. So uh, if you were not part of the inner circle, you you didn't see this coming, did you? No, not at all. (laughs) Well, you know, it's kind of funny you mentioned inner circle because in the middle of this announcement, Stupid, uh, and started saying, well, you know, we can do, we can go in this direction. We can make sure that we deliberate these things, but not come to any kind of vote. We'll just have a resolu- a vote on a resolution so that uh, Cardinal DiNardo can have something to bring with him to Rome for the big meeting in, in February, the three-day meeting in February on this particular topic. Um, almost as if he had foreknowledge of what was happening and had a... Uh, um, a canned statement giving directive to what was going to be taking place in the next few days. Well, I, I suppose it's not impossible that, that the Holy Spirit or his guardian angel prompted him to uh, to stand up and, and make such a pronouncement. What was the response from Cardinal DiNardo, and, and was there any uh, murmuring or movement among the bishops when, when, when this was dropped on them? Well, I, I wasn't in the room, so I can't uh, I can't really speak to the kind of murmuring or anything like that, but the the uh, what I am hearing here on the ground is that both liberal and conservative bishops were very shocked at uh, at the announcement and kind of stunned and didn't really know what to do. And the USCCB, in their statements and deliberations throughout the day, they've had uh, uh, Eucharistic adoration, the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, um, and they've had all these people coming up and giving talks throughout the day. With the Blessed Sacrament exposed, which I think is not what you're supposed to do. Um, well, that's so I, I, I need to double check, but I don't think you're supposed to do that either. I, I think only a cleric should be speaking when the Blessed Sacrament is exposed. But I, uh, I I'll have to look up that and get back to our listeners. Yeah, it uh, it was it was rather shocking to see because they do have the live stream video of the meetings, um, at least the ones that are made available to the public. But yeah, they had uh, they had nuns up there, well, pantsuit nuns, 
uh, giving talks about various things, one of which actually said that she doesn't pray the, uh, the creed because she doesn't agree with everything in it right there before the Blessed Sacrament. So, you know, I, it, oh. I think the whole thing's been turned upside down, and there's a lot of turmoil going on in there right now. Well, the, the, I, I'm gobsmacked. I'm, I'm usually not at a loss for words. That's, uh, that's astonishing. Uh, so what, what are the bishops going to talk about now that they don't have the hot issue that everyone was waiting for guidance for? How are they going to fill their day? That's a good question. Um, I think that probably what Cardinal Supic uh, put forward, this idea that they're going to be deliberating on the same things without actually voting on a real course of action, but just on resolutions on what uh, things for Cardinal DiNardo to bring with him to Rome, I think is probably the direction they're going to take at this point. Has there been, been leaked or, or, or deliberately made public what the shape of that proposition might look like? Not at the moment. Hmm. Hmm. There's, I, th I understand there's also going to be under consideration a, a pastoral letter regarding racism? Uh, I, I actually don't know much about that one. I've been paying so much attention to, uh, to this other news. Um, right. One of the things right. that I can tell you that's going on here, uh, I'm, I, I'm outside, so if you hear people talking, that's why, but mm -hmm. there's a crowd that's already gathered, uh, a bunch of women holding up signs saying, ordain women now and that kind of thing. So... Oh. Um, the, the the heretics have already stepped up outside uh, to maybe support the heretics on the inside. Who knows? Uh, well, I understand there, there's a larger group that's going to be forming up tomorrow. Can you tell us some more about that, that's please? That's correct. So tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a very large gathering of faithful Catholics coming to pray for the bishops uh, and to make acts of reparation for the sacrileges that have been committed um, by a lot of the bishops and, and uh, in, in the way that they've covered up for the sex abuse crisis, um, and specifically for the abusers themselves. Uh, so there, there are about two to 3,000 people that are anticipated to be here praying right next to the hotel um, for the bishops. So, and I'm going to be one of the speakers. Michael Boris is a speaker. Alan Keyes is a speaker. Uh, they're also going to have Siobhan O'Connor, who uh, was the whistleblower in the Albany Diocese. She's a speaker. Uh, Buffalo. I think she's a diocese uh, and, and of several Buffalo. Others. Yeah. Okay. And, and what's, what's, the, what's the intention of the organizers? Why, why are these people coming, and how many are, are you expecting? About two to 3,000 people, from what I understand. Um, and, and the purpose really is uh, to prayerfully, uh, to, well, to give prayer and sacrifice to the bishops and, and to uh, try and give them the spiritual strength that they need in order to, to get through the crisis and to encourage the bishops. We've, we've actually invited bishops to come down and join us. We'll be praying the rosary. Um, but it's, it's really a prayer gathering, a prayer rally with, with talks uh, designed specifically to give spiritual support to our bishops, because if they're not leading us through this crisis, we, we're a rudderless ship. Have, has anyone responded to the invitation yet? I, I think that there's a possibility we may have one bishop come down and join us for the rosary. Um, okay, I'll let you. I'll, I'll let you know if that happens. I don't want to drop any names if it doesn't. Sure. No. No. I. I, I understand. Uh, I, I understand. And, and uh, these people are coming from where? Are, are they locals, or are they they traveling some distance? We have people that are flying in from California. We've got people that are taking buses down from New Jersey. Uh, we, I've heard people are driving all the way up from Florida. So people are coming from all across the country to be a part of this rally. Okay. All right. And how long are they going to stay? The, uh, the rally tomorrow afternoon is going to be from 1.30 until 5 o'clock. Okay. Uh, so it's a it's a good four and a half hours that we'll be out here in the cold. <laughs> oh, oh my! Well, God bless you. Stay warm. Is there a website associated with with uh, with the organization? Yes. If you go to thebishopsnew.com, dot uh, com, mm -hmm. then uh, they'll be able to uh, to take a look and see how things are going. And and uh, if you're nearby, please come join us. Right. Now, now, Michael, you're, you're a, a faithful Catholic. You pray, I know we've talked before. I was removed when you said that, you know, for people who are involved in public struggles in the church, it's important to pray the, the litany of, of humility. Um, what's yeah. it like for you, just as a faithful Catholic, to be there in, in a time of, of crisis? You know, I, um, 
I don't really worry so much about the uh, the crisis itself. I, I worry more about the souls of the bishops and the priests that are in, in, in just enmeshed in the scandals. Um, and I, I see the people that are that are losing their faith because of the inability of the leadership of of the church. And so my my concerns really are for the souls that are that are potentially being lost because of the the, the faithless shepherds who won't step up and help. And, and draw those people back into uh, back into the fold and, and help and nourish and, and guide them to salvation. That's what the church exists for. So I, I'm here and I I see the crisis. I understand it, but I, I'm not really I, I'm not affected by it so much as as I just desire so much for the salvation of souls. And I hope that the bishops have that have that same hope. <laughs> Well, yes, well, we all have an obligation to pray and sacrifice for our shepherds to make reparation for sins and to let this difficult time uh, be a, give us some momentum to our own conversion and our own repentance. Michael Hitchpoint of the Lepanto Institute calling in live from the bishops' meeting in Baltimore. I'm very grateful for your time and attention, and I hope you'll be on the Catholic Current again soon. I sure will. Thank you so much, Father. Stay with us. When we come back, we're going to have Professor Scott Gaylord of the Law School of Elon University address the question, will Christian businesses be put out of business? And we want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now and call us at 1-877-511-5483. Text us at the same number, 1-877-511-5483. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern for Sermons for Everyday Living, a program that brings you real sermons from real priests on topics important to you and your faith. Visit thestationofthecross.com for details. Be sure to tune in to The Catholic Current on Friday, November 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern for an extra special edition. The topic will be Catholic journalism, fake news. This episode comes in light of recent developments on social media calling for Catholic news websites to be removed, as well as from paragraph 146 of the final document from the Youth Synod calling for certification of websites to protect the faithful from fake news. In segment one, Father Robert McTagg will interview John Henry Weston of LifeSite News. In segment two, we'll We'll hear from George Newmayer of The American Spectator and author of the book, The Political Pope. Segment 3, Father will welcome in Michael Voris of Church Militant. And in the last segment, you'll hear from Michael Hitchborn of the Lepanto Institute. Each guest either represents one of the sites that others have urged to be deplatformed for fake news or hate speech, or are individuals who have been so attacked. You won't want to miss The Catholic Current on Friday, November 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern, only on the Station of the Cross. Do you ever wonder where God is in your suffering or what His will is for you as you struggle in the faith? Each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, a program to inspire you and offer solutions to many of life's challenges. Mother Miriam is a Catholic nun whose humor and holiness, along with years of theological training, bless all who are in need of encouragement and practical advice. Listen on your local Station of the Cross affiliate or on our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. That's Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, weekdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Each morning, the Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion. So make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at the station of the cross.com 
Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. And we want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now at one 511 5483 or text us at the same number, one 511 Eight, three. And our first segment, we visited with Michael Hitchborn of the Lepanto Institute, calling live from the Bishop's Conference meeting in Baltimore. For the rest of the show, we're going to have as our guest, Professor Scott Gaylord, Professor of Law at the Law School of Elon University in North Carolina, and we'll be addressing the question, will... Christian businesses be put out of business. Professor Gaylord's scholarship and teaching focus on constitutional law, equal protection, and due process speech and religious issues. Scott Gaylord, welcome to The Catholic Current. Good evening. Thank you for having me on the program. Uh, Scott, I, I'm, uh, a lot of my friends are and, and people uh, affiliated with the program have been calling in and have been asking me, uh, what about the these Christian businesses that have been lightning rods for lawsuits and human rights investigations and so on. And uh, the most celebrated and most notorious, depending upon your point of view, is the Masterpiece Cake Shop uh, case. Can you give our listeners a, a quick summary of what happened there and what, what issues are at stake? Certainly. Yeah, Masterpiece Cake Shop certainly has been the probably leading case. There were a series of them with bakers, florists, photographers, and an ongoing conflict between uh, public accommodations laws, which mm-hmm. generally prohibit discrimination based on certain types of classifications or categories, and the religious believers who operate businesses. And if the laws prevent discrimination <clears throat> and when applied to these businesses, they have a tendency to discriminate against the owners of the business. Now, all laws discriminate in some way or other, right. and so how do you balance when these two things come together? So in Masterpiece Cake Shop, a same-sex couple came to uh, Jack Phillips, who owns Masterpiece Cake Shop, and asked him to make a wedding cake for their same-sex wedding. He declined, invoking his religious beliefs that marriage is between one man and one woman, and said that he would be unable to do that. That would conflict with his views. The couple then uh, brought a claim with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, or division. Uh, they investigated and ultimately brought charges, and he was found uh, guilty under the act of discriminating against the same, uh, based on sexual orientation. Now, now this couple, uh, do they have absolutely no access to any other baker in the state of Colorado? They can only go to Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop? No, I, I think the evidence indicated there were a lot, a variety of different bakers who would be willing to do that. Uh, but the public, well, I guess a couple of things. One, the Colorado public accommodations law doesn't require them to do that before uh, bringing in action. And I, I think one of the big surprises, which may, people may not be aware of, is that under the United States Constitution, which is you know usually where I think people go to look to, for protection of fundamental rights, like free speech, due process, equal protection. In a lot of these types of cases where you have these uh, public accommodations laws, the free exercise clause does not provide a lot of protection for the business owners. So you've got to try to find some other way to get that protection, um, either through uh, some evidence of discrimination against religion or through a First Amendment speech analysis. Now, my understanding was that he he doesn't flat out refuse to do business with with anyone with same sex attraction, and you know, he'd sell them other other, uh, other cakes or services and so on. I think his stipulation was that he would not contribute for this particular uh, event of the the marriage of of a same sex couple. Uh, so his his refusal was rather narrow. He didn't throw them out and say we don't serve your kind here. Isn't that correct? That is correct, and that's a point that uh, Justices Gorsuch and Alito bring up in uh, their uh, uh, concurring opinions in the Masterpiece Cake Shop. And part of that goes then to how the court should go about doing what we call a statutory analysis. How should they evaluate these public accommodation laws, and are they triggered in the first instance at all in this situation? Uh, As you mentioned, Jack Phillips says... Look, I'll serve you anything else in the store. I've got pre-made cakes, I've got cookies, brownies, donuts, whatever it may be. I will serve you those. It's not that. It's just based on my religious beliefs. I don't feel like I can, in good faith, make this cake as part of a celebration of, of an event that I, I can't 
you know, condone as, as part of my religious principles. And so he would say, I'm not discriminating based on sexual orientation. I'm just living out my faith and will accommodate you in any other way that I can, but I can't do this particular thing you're asking of me. Did the court make any note or uh, have any comment about the fact that th this couple deliberately sought out a, a Christian bake shop? No, they really didn't get into that. And this is, I guess, common in this type of litigation where, you know, whoever the plaintiff is, someone challenging a federal law or state law or someone who's trying to uh, impose something like the public accommodations law on a, a Christian business owner, you want to find, if you will, a good plaintiff. You want to get a good test case. And so this is the way you, you do that. You try to find someone who goes to a Christian baker who has views like this. Uh, you get the, you ask them to do something, they say no, and then you've set the predicate for being able to bring a legal action. And, you know, in our society nowadays, I don't know, you may remember it back in the day, uh, 40s, 50s, uh, there used to be an expression, there ought to be a law. Right. So people would look to the legislature to help resolve these things. Now, I think what you hear more is this idea there ought to be a constitutional right. And so yes. so many of our rights, it's, we're not talking to each other and trying to work out and figure out what would be a reasonable accommodation for all parties involved. We're trying to get the courts to rule in our favor so that we win and we won't be satisfied until we get constitutional approval or authority for whatever it is we're trying to do. And, and that can be on both sides of this issue where we see that happening. Right. There seems to be a, a lot of arm twisting involved rather than, than searching for the truth uh, underlying the law. Uh, Scott, are you aware in, in your research in these cases, has there been, have there been uh, same-sex couples going to Muslim bakeries uh, insisting on a wedding cake? I do not know of one off the top of my head. So far, the, okay. the focus has been on uh, Christian bakers or other um, types of establishment florists, photographers. There may be, I just don't, it has not garnered that I know of the same type of national attention. And there's actually another a cake case that's been petitioned to the United States Supreme Court out of Oregon, a, a business called Sweet Cakes, and their business is only custom design cakes. So they're trying to sort of, the, the, the Supreme Court in Masterpiece Cake Shop, if you will, punted on some of the bigger issues and sort of narrowly ruled in favor of Masterpiece Cake Shop, but there's some bigger First Amendment religion and speech issues that are still outstanding that need to be addressed by the court. So how, how likely is it that we're going to see the, uh, this case from Oregon go up to the Supreme Court anytime soon? Well, the, the petition's going to be up there. Whether the court will accept it is always a hard thing. I mean, the United States Supreme Court accepts, I don't know, somewhere between 1% or 2% of the cases that are petitioned, so it's always hard mm -hmm. to get there. Now, the current makeup mm -hmm. of the court, with Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh now on it, may open the possibilities for the court to reconsider some of these views. They just granted a petition, and we'll hear a case dealing a memorial cross out of the state of Maryland. And in that case, the, the justices will get a chance to look at their establishment clause jurisprudence, and it gives them an opportunity to clarify that. We could have something similar on the free exercise uh, side of things as well, which I think, at least from a clarity perspective, would be helpful and give greater guidance to uh, religious business owners. So uh, so the Masterpiece Cake Shop, that, that was decided rather narrowly, wasn't it? And what was, what was the final outcome of the case? Yes, so it was very you're right. It's very narrow in terms of, and this goes back to sort of the status of the free exercise clause and the the court's jurisprudence. If a law is what the court calls gen, uh, neutral and generally applicable, so if it's a law that just sort of applies to everybody and there's no indication of on the face of the statute of discriminating, then it's a very low, very deferential review to the state. In order to get a higher review and to have traction, you've got to show some type of discrimination. And what the court did is look at the procedural posture of the case and notice that for a couple different reasons, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, when they were looking at this case and, and considering uh, Jack Phillips's uh, defense of free exercise, they exhibited sort of a hostility to his religious beliefs. That then triggered what the court calls strict scrutiny, a very high level of review. Typically, if you're strict in theory, fatal in fact, very hard for the government to win, and they struck it down because of this uh, discrimination towards his religious beliefs. So if the tone of the Colorado Civil Rights Division had been uh, more, more moderate or more anodyne, it, it might not have uh, been subject to review of the Supreme Court at all? It could have been reviewed, but then the court probably would have ruled in favor of uh, 
the, the challenges in the case and not Masterpiece Cake Shop. That's correct. So it doesn't provide a great level of protection. A Christian business really to take advantage of Masterpiece Cake Shop has to be in a situation where the authorities below, simply somebody in the sort of trial or judicial review process, uh, openly expresses hostility uh, toward or takes some actions treating secular views better than the religious views um, and shows discrimination. And if not, I mean, one of the, the strange things about, I think, the Masterpiece Cake Shop opinion is that ultimately Jack Phillips would lose under the public accommodations law. It's only because the commissioners came out, well, a couple of reasons. One, because the commissioner came out and basically was being insulting towards the religious beliefs, calling him, what do you say, um, one of the most despicable, this is a quote, one of the most despicable pieces of rhetoric that people can use to, to use their religion to hurt others, end quote. So the court found that to be problematic. And then the Civil Rights Commission had treated some other claims, uh, other cases differently than Jack Phillips. So they, they took that to be evidence of discrimination. But absent that evidence of discrimination, Jack Phillips loses. <laughs> and there's not a lot of uh, fanfare about that. Well, well my, my understanding is that he's uh, involved in, in another controversy, uh, as well as kind of Masterpiece Cake Shop Part 2. Uh, there is, uh, I believe, an attorney now uh, uh, called Autumn Scardina, who is transgendered and is asking to have a cake made to celebrate it's coming out as transgendered, and they're they're back to to square one again. Um, wh where is that? I understand the the CCRD uh, wanted Phillips to go into compulsory mediation. Can you tell us more about that, please? Yeah, I, I don't know the exact where it is exactly right now, but you're correct that while the court was considering this case, then this fact pattern developed as well, where an individual called for the um, a cake for the. Um, if you will, reveal, transgender reveal um, situation where I think he was going to either blue frosting with pink inside or vice versa. And Jack Phillips and someone at his store said, no, sorry, we can't do that. That goes against our religious beliefs. And now then charges brought under the Civil Rights CATA, which is the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act, is the one that's applicable here, again, showing discrimination towards based on sexual orientation um, and gender identity in this situation. And so those claims are working their way through. Now, whether the Civil Rights Division or Commission, who was discriminatory before, could then hear this case again and, and not be, even if they don't say anything, I think it's going to be a difficult one uh, for the court to stomach if, uh, you know, you have the same people who were ex displaying hostility now treat the case and give the same outcome. Their views probably haven't changed much. I think, Jack, but Jack Phillips is going to have to rely on that type of analysis because he can't claim any higher free exercise protection. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Scott Gaylord, a professor of law, regarding conscience clauses in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and we want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now at 1-877-511-5483, or text us at the same number, 1-877-511-5483. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Station of the Cross invites you to join us each day for the Liturgy of the Hours at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The Liturgy of the Hours is the daily prayer of the Church and is made up of readings from sacred scripture, writings from saints and theologians, and small reflections. For details about each hour and more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. We hope you'll join us for this daily prayer of the Church each day at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Station of the Cross. Want to help the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network through a transfer of stock? Transferring stock is a unique and simple way you can support our mission to evangelize the world over the airwaves, through mobile devices, and on our website. Please prayerfully consider donating stock from your investment portfolio to help Catholic Radio grow stronger. If you are being called by God to donate through a transfer of stock from your brokerage account to ours, please ask your broker to contact us at 1-877-888-6200. 
1-800-227-1379. Your broker will need to indicate the number of shares being transferred as well as the QCIP number of those shares. That's 1-877-888-6279. Thank you for considering a gift of stock to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network so that we can continue proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. The Station of the Cross offers online tutorials to help you get the most out of your iCatholic Radio app. You'll be introduced to our latest features and the opportunities available for not only listening to our live stream, but also to a variety of podcasts of our shows, prayers, and special presentations. For these tutorials and more, click on the iCatholic Radio link located on the Stations page of our website, thestationofthecross.com. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. And we want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now at one 511 5483 or text us at the same number, one 511 5483 At the top of the hour, we had Michael Hitchborn of the Lepanto Institute call in live from Baltimore to give us a report on the first day of the bishops' meetings in Baltimore. And then we later took up the conversation with Scott Gaylord, professor of law at Elon University School of Law, a specialist in First Amendment issues. And we are talking about the topic, will Christian businesses be put out of business? And... We recently talked about the Masterpiece Cake Shop controversies that ended up in the Supreme Court. In this segment, we're going to look at conscience clauses and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, Scott, I've been working in medical ethics for a good number of years, and I do some work with the Catholic Medical Association. And whenever doctors get together, they, they run around with uh, new formulas of a conscience clause as like the, they were they were grandmothers at a Christmas swap uh, exchanging recipes and I shake my head uh, the cynic in me says that a conscience clause is uh, akin to uh, a battered woman saying my boyfriend can't hit me anymore I have a restraining order is a conscience clause uh, a lot of hope in a small piece of paper or is there something more to it that Christian business owners should be looking at well, I think, under, as I mentioned in the, in the last segment, under the court's current free exercise clause in uh, jurisprudence, there isn't a lot of protection inherent uh, in the free exercise clause. So, as I mentioned, neutral, generally applicable laws can be applied against religious practitioners, and the government needs to have only a, basically a rational basis for having the law. But what I like to call and tell my students the giggle test, as long as there's some nat- non-laughable reason, the government usually wins. Mm-hmm. In the wake of that, and so the court adopted this into a case called Employment Division versus Smith. Some people may have heard about it as the peyote case, where a Native American practitioner was ingesting peyote as part of his Native American uh, religious ceremony. And he was ultimately fired for using an hallucinogenic drug that was banned under Oregon law. The court basically said, well, it's a neutral law, so you don't really have a claim. There's nothing you can do about it. You're not entitled to unemployment benefits. Three years later, in 1993, the uh, Congress passed the RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and there was broad-based support at that time. So you had it unanimous in the House, which I think is hard to imagine nowadays, only mm-hmm. three dissents in the Senate, and then President Clinton signed it into law. This type of statutory protection, now these are, this applies only to federal actions, federal laws, so you can use this, but you have to rely now on this type of statutory protection for religious practitioners. It, for a neutral general applicable law. If you can show some types of discrimination, as we mentioned, with respect to Masterpiece Cake Shop, then you might still be able to have some type of constitutional defense. But barring that, you need some type of statutory authorization. And so RIFRA does that at the federal level. Uh, you may recall five, six, seven years ago, there's a whole big national issue over state RIFRAs, whether states right. should be able to do this. And Indiana got a lot of pressure, and North Carolina did, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, 
there are a whole bunch of states that were contemplating this. But if you believe or want sort of any type of uh, robust uh, protection for free exercise, these types of provisions are now necessary under the court's jurisprudence. So should Christian business owners uh, be anxious? Uh, is it possible that someone's going to come in and, and demand something that could, even if it doesn't put you out of business, might get you vilified in, in social media, uh, and you, you could lose business that way, or you could be racking up a, a enormous attorney fees uh, as well. Um, are, are we dealing with real legal disputes, or, or are we, is someone using the courts as a social bludgeon against Christians? Well, there certainly end up being real legal disputes because the, the courts are taking some of these cases and trying to make sense and resolve those. But it's certainly, if you will, uh, social, political, religious issues playing out through these cases. And, and the courts are being used, as I mentioned before, uh, both sides in some sense not really trying to engage in converse, at least some folks, not trying to engage in conversation and just trying to get a victory. And they won't be satisfied until it's absolute victory. Um, and that ends up being problematic because in these situations then, like you're saying, business owners can be in a very difficult situation. One, the business owners need to check their states and see what types of protections. I think it's uh, somewhere around 20 states have state RIFRAs and mm -hmm. another roughly 12 have state constitutional provisions that have been interpreted like the RIFRAs to provide this heightened level of scrutiny, we call strict scrutiny review um, for uh, individuals. So in those states, you have some protection that might be at the state level, not the federal constitutional. For you know, your, your listeners, the, the federal constitution, we usually look to that, but that provides a floor of protection. States can provide greater protection. And so in the states with state riffers or state constitutional provisions that have been interpreted this higher level of review, that's a good place to start. That's a good place to look, and you might be able to get some uh, help from the state constitution or state statutes. Something are like there states? states Colorado did not have it. Uh, are there states that, that are, are known for being, uh, lack of a better term, more well-disposed, more friendly to people with, with religious convictions and, and conscience clause reservations? I'm sure there there are states, I mean, in terms of just thinking of one off the top of the head that would have it, not necessarily any one that comes to mind like this is the most right, pro-Christian right. business climate. But I mm -hmm. think these states that have these types of protections on a whole would be considered probably, if you will, more friendly to it uh, because they provide some uh, greater protection for claims of discrimination. And and you can see the power of the of, uh, RIFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, right. and things like the Little Sisters of the Poor or... Um, uh, Hobby Lobby is probably the biggest one, right, where right. you can really get some some significant level of protection and make it much harder for the government to impose something like a public accommodations law on a religious practitioner. And in that situation, then that would create a better climate. Obviously, the test cases are usually coming out of states that do not have that type of protection in order, you know, you're going to pick your jurisdiction well to, to have the best chance of success for your client. And something like Colorado then is a good place since it doesn't have that type of protection. Scott, we, we got a, a message from one of our listeners, uh, Tony, T-O-N-I, uh, and Tony says, when the government starts paying for the operational cost of a business, then they can have a say as to who is, is a customer. W would you b use that as an argument in court? Well, you'd have to see, certainly if the federal government is engaged in some type of spending program and they're going to condition those funds on a business um, you know, taking certain actions, and if the business owner agrees with that, then certainly. I mean, I certainly I would be wary if the government just coming in and taking over and then dictating what had to be done. Uh, I'd much rather see that as some type of you know voluntary agreement, where then you might get some type of uh, subsidy or aid from from the state using its spending power, but not mandating and forcing um, individuals to comply with the state sense of um, morals, religion, whatever it may be. You know, I'm, I'm thinking back to, I mean, I don't know how long that you, you've been practicing law, but I imagine there must have been a time where you couldn't have imagined that we would be having such a conversation uh, as, as we're having now. Um, what happened in, in legal theory and law schools now that, this, this is, that, we're, that these very topics are under consideration? The, you know, should poor nuns be forced to pay for contraceptives? I, I can't imagine that conversation taking place 35 or 40 years ago. What, what's happened? 
Well, that's that's a good question, and probably a different. One. I imagine there are a lot of different factors that have played in. I think certainly one of uh, the factors is the reliance on the courts to resolve these types of issues. And the more the courts have gotten involved, and this will start back in, you know, the Warren Court in the 60s and 70s, and sort of ongoing looking to the courts to resolve these big social issues. I mean, certainly it's one of the arguments here, folks, with uh, Roe versus Wade right. and challenges to that whether the court should have weighed in. So, I mean, the the, the the foundation for this goes back decades now in terms of the court's role and involvement. And if the court's going to take a role in dictating some of these social policies, and obviously people disagree on each side whether they should or shouldn't, but if so, these issues become much more charged and the place to get them resolved is in the court system. So you're going to bring these suits. And as you have success in certain types of claims, now you bring more. You expand the sphere. You're going to bring different claims. And all of a sudden, whereas you mentioned probably 30, 40 years ago, you can't imagine the little sisters of the poor being dragged into court on this. Now we have it. And, you know, and really the little sisters, they're not being dragged in. They're being used as good plaintiffs to challenge the law. They, they're they're right. now being sought out for, hey, we have good plaintiffs that we can use to challenge what was going on under the Affordable Care Act and try to protect the rights of the individuals. Now you have groups on both sides, if you will, the quote unquote left, the quote unquote right, liberal versus conservative. You have groups, national organizations that are actively working and trying to protect the interests of their constituencies. That may be in the sort of liberal causes or conservative, but that now has fostered, you know, it used to be more maybe the, um, uh, the ACLU or others were sort of the more active. Now you'll see groups like Alliance Defending Freedom or the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty and other national groups getting involved and um, actively participating in defending religious freedom um, claims. You know, Scott, uh, in Catholic social theory, a very important principle is the principle of subsidiarity, that matters should be dealt with as locally as possible, and you only work your way up the chain of command when it can't be resolved at a more local level, and that decisions are, are best made by people who are directly involved in, in the matter under discussion. Uh, should these kinds of questions, it, has something gone wrong that these are being dealt with at a federal level rather than a more local or a state level? I certainly agree with you from the Catholic you know, social teaching and, and the principles of subsidiarity are really lost now in the national debate. And right. again, this is an ongoing process as well. Trace it back to different things, but with certainly with the growth of the federal government and involvement in a lot of different areas with the, the explosion of the administrative state post-New Deal, you have a federal government that's involved in all sorts of different things. And again, for better or for worse, depends on one view. Reasonable people disagree. But the fact is the federal government is involved in large swaths of areas for social, economic, religious, all sorts of things. And the more that happens, then you do have a national government that's trying to dictate and determine the solutions for everybody at the same time, where the local problems, local issues may be and likely could be better resolved um, by being addressed at the local level, be that state, um, you know, city, county, whatever it may be. Uh, Scott, I, I've had folks uh, say to me, and I'm sure you've heard this too, look, if, if, a, if a Christian baker doesn't want to make a, a wedding cake for a same-sex couple, how is it different from a restaurant owner uh, telling African Americans, we don't serve your kind here, you're not welcome here? You know, isn't this just a variation of the old Jim Crow argument? So w what's your response to that? Well, there's certainly, a, you know, a threat for the sort of broad-based discrimination uh, that went on with you know racist tendencies and race-based discrimination uh and and that's certainly a, a powerful claim and argument you know i think you have to look at different communities and societies under even like a rifra if you could establish that there were no other bakers if there was nobody else providing these services then the government could still win and require folks to do it what we see and as, as you think you mentioned previously in a lot of these situations, it's not the same broad-based discrimination um, that has gone on. One, two, the classification is not what um, the court calls a suspect classification. Race, national origin, these are what are called suspect classifications under equal protection analysis. Uh, sexual orientation is not. Now, some people certainly would want it to be, but currently it's not. It's treated along the lines of economic distinctions, veteran status, those types of things. Um, so it's not clear if, if it should be treated at the same high level uh, or not with respect to it, and then more importantly, the, the broad-based discrimination, although there has been discrimination certainly against folks, it's not necessarily there. And even in Jack Phillips' case with Masterpiece Cake Shop, he's willing to serve them anything else in the store. 
So Mm -hmm. his concern really rests not just in terms of of the individuals and trying to refuse them service across the board, but to live his faith, which is different than their view of marriage. And that that different view, we we need to be able as a society to accommodate that. And in fact, Justice Kennedy in Obergefell even says that religious observers should be allowed to still promulgate their beliefs and faiths and live in the society, and we can agree to disagree. We are continuing our conversation regarding Christian businesses. Will they be put out of business? And we will want you to be part of the conversation. Call us now at 1-877-511-5483. Text us the same number, 1-877-511-5483. When we come back, we're going to ask what can be done to help Christian business owners to protect them and to defend them. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Please pray with us this act of consecration of the human race to the sacred heart of Jesus. Most sweet Jesus, Redeemer of the human race, look down upon us humbly prostrate before thy altar. We are thine, and thine we wish to be. But to be more surely united with thee, behold, each one of us freely consecrates ourselves to thy most sacred heart. Be thou King, O Lord, not only of the faithful who have never forsaken thee, but also of the prodigal children who have abandoned thee. Grant that they may quickly return to their father's house, lest they die of wretchedness and hunger. Be thou king of those who are deceived by erroneous opinions, or whom discord keeps aloof. Call them back to the harbor of truth and unity of faith, so that soon there may be but one flock and one shepherd. Be thou king of all those who are still involved in the darkness of idolatry or of false religions. Refuse not to draw them all into the light and kingdom of God. Turn thine eyes of mercy toward the children of that race, once thy chosen people. Of old they call down upon themselves the blood of the Savior. May it now descend upon them a layer of redemption and of life. Grant, O Lord, to thy church assurance of freedom and immunity from harm. Give peace and order to all nations, and make the earth resound from pole to pole with one cry. Praise to the divine heart that wrought our salvation. To it be glory and honor forever. Amen. This is Father Jacek Mazur. Please join me in a prayer honoring St. Francis Xavier Cabrini. Almighty and Eternal Father, giver of all gifts, show us your mercy and grant, we beseech you, through the merits of your faithful servant, St. Francis, that all who invoke her intercession may obtain what they desire according to the good pleasure of your holy will. Amen. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Shortly after the show, visit our page for the Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. You'll find a link to today's episode page where you can view Father McTague's show resources and today's podcast. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. And we want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now and call us at 1-877-511-5483 or text us at the same number. 1-877-511-5483. At the top of the hour, we had a visit from Michael Hitchborn of the Lepanto Institute reporting live from the Bishop's Conference in Baltimore. And then we took up the conversation with Scott Gaylord, professor of law at Elon University School of Law. And we're addressing the question, will Christian businesses be put out of business? So far, we've talked about the celebrated or notorious master key, masterpiece cake shop case in the Supreme Court. We've talked about conscience clauses and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. In this segment, we're going to look at 
what can be done. Scott, if we're up to you, if you got a phone call from Mitch McConnell and said, hey, you know, we want to... We want a really good Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and we want it done upright, and we want to make sure that poor nuns aren't dragged into court for refusing to pay for contraceptives. What would the outline of that law look like if you were, if you were given that task, Scott? Well, on the federal side, I think the Federal uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act and then its sister statute, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, so RIFRA and RELUPA, uh, provide pretty broad-based protection. So as it currently stands on the federal side, and especially as interpreted by the Supreme Court, and with the changes on the Supreme Court, I imagine that it'll still be interpreted in this very uh, religious, protective way. I think that's in pretty good shape. I think the concern is is that there are efforts to challenge RIFRs, like we mentioned five, six years ago, this broad uh, public outcry over the discriminatory, discriminatory nature of RIFRAs, and if that gets traction at the state level, we're going to see challenges to the federal RIFRA. And if the federal RIFRA disappears, then religious practitioners are going to lose that protection at the, at the federal side. At the state level, um, I think if, if we're looking for protection at that level, then the same type of thing where you have a very high standard of review under uh, the RIFRA regime right now, it's the, the burdens on the religious practitioner to show that they have a sincerely held belief and that there's a substantial burden on that re- belief. If they establish that, then the burden shifts over to the government to establish that it has a compelling interest and what the court calls narrowly tailored. And that's a very difficult standard to meet. And that's where we've seen Hobby Lobby um, in other cases success, at least at the Supreme Court level. The, some of the circuit courts have, have been less likely to grant that. But I think as this court continues to hear the RIFRA claims, uh, it'll show that it's an extremely broad protection for religious practitioners. How does one demonstrate in, in federal court that one's uh, religious belief is uh, sincerely held? Yeah, it's interesting. So the, the court has said that with respect to uh, religious beliefs and practices, the, the court system is really limited in what it can do. The one thing it can do is determine whether a belief is sincerely held. What it can't do is say whether beliefs are true or false or whether they're central to a, a religious belief or any of those types of things. You, you hit on a really good point. It's hard to know whether it's sincerely held or not. Now, in these cases, the, uh, the plaintiffs have been, if you will, chosen well. So in Hobby Lobby, you had the owners of Hobby Lobby and the owners of Conestoga Wood Specialties, and it was clear that they were very devout, faithful individuals. Again, I think the Little Sisters of the Poor just a fantastic plaintiff. I mean, it, it's hard to beat having all these wonderful women who have dedicated their lives in full habits, you know, right. in the front row of, of the court and say, okay, you tell them they don't really believe it. Um, so <laughs> right. when, you have, yes. when you have good plaintiffs, the sincerity of belief question just sort of goes away. The, the government will say, yeah, we admit it, because they just, they just can't challenge it. Um, so then it falls to whether or not there's a substantial burden on the religious practitioners. Uh, and I, I'm concerned, you know, given my, my background in, in medical ethics, suppose you have a, a doctor who's a trauma surgeon, a level one trauma uh, surgeon, and he's, he's told, hey, you know, we have a patient here who's been sexually assaulted. Uh, she wants a plan B or a morning after pill, or sometimes called emergency contraception. Uh, one could easily understand that request. And then the doctor says, well, it can also work as an abortifacient. And for religious reasons, I can't comply. I mean, I've seen some analyses that say, hey, if your religious uh, uh, beliefs can't allow you to practice all of what medicine can provide, then it's time for you to get out of medicine or become an anesthesiologist or an x-ray technician or a, a dental hygienist. What's your view on that? Yeah, those are difficult questions, and that's the same thing. So your medical doctor example is a good one, but the same uh, issues arising for the businesses themselves. I mean, the, the solution for the Colorado Civil Rights Commission or the commission in New Mexico for Elaine's Photography was basically to say, hey, if you're going to be a business, then you've got to do it. If not, get out of the business. You've got to go do something else. And that puts religious practitioners, I think, to an extremely difficult choice. Are those really the only options? And now for your example of the doctor, if they're, you have to see what the, the governing laws are in terms of required to treat and what types of treatment are, are, mm-hmm. are necessary. But suppose there is a general obligation and responsibility to treat, absent any type of uh, conscience or refusal law or some type of state RIFRA, then the expectation would be that the doctor must provide. And so then you have the direct conflict between these laws that are meant to advance health and safety as determined by the legislature running in direct conflict with the religious beliefs of practitioners. 
Um, and, and the courts, are, we're seeing this work out again. As I mentioned, Masterpiece Cake Shop really didn't resolve all the issues raised by that because of the particular discrimination. But those are issues that are still percolating in the, the lower courts. And, and there's a similar situation now with uh, some family-owned pharmacies and so on that, that won't sell, for example, the, the morning after pill or, or, or RU486. Uh, is there any uh, expectation of protection for them, or, or are they just going to have to be dragged into court and throw the dice? You, they have to check their state statutes and certainly talk with their state legislatures to see if they can get any particular statutory protection. Uh, at the uh, constitutional level, federal constitutional level, there's not a lot of protection that's uh, built into there. So mm -hmm. uh, the expectation that absent some type of statutory protection uh, would make it very difficult for them. Um, and because you, again, you have to look for any signs of discrimination or targeting uh, based on their religious beliefs. But you know, in the wake of Masterpiece Cake Shop, what we're going to see, I think, would be state officials who are, uh, how should we put it, nicely skeptical of religion or um, dislike some of these views that religious practitioners have. Uh, I think the lesson for Masterpiece Cake Shop is just be quiet. Don't say it. Don't articulate your distrust, dislike, scorn uh, for religious practitioners, and then you'll have a much better chance of being able to force them uh, to do whatever it is you want to do. So is this kind of a variation of don't ask, don't tell? <laughs> we'll have to see how it's interpreted. <laughs> I, I think the suggestion certainly is, so, you know, as you mentioned before, if the commission, the few commissioners on the Colorado Civil Rights Commission had just been silent and not said anything, then it's very likely Jack Phillips loses without a lot of publicity or, I mean, well, still could get some publicity, but without a real concern by the United States Supreme Court because a neutrally, generally applicable law was applied and Jack Phillips loses when that happens, absent any indication of discrimination. So for the, the ordinary Catholic, uh, what do we do? I mean, do we, do we all have to get law degrees? Do we all need uh, lawyers on retainer? Do we just fast and pray? Are there practical steps or we just have to keep our fingers crossed? Uh, well, I think prayer is always a great place to start. Um, in, in terms of the, the faithful who are operating the businesses and concerned of this, I do think there are a few steps you can uh, take maybe to, to work towards this. One, obviously, as I'm sure a lot of these folks are doing and trying to live their faith in their business and in their everyday lives, is treating others with respect and charity. Uh, then get to know the laws in your state. Know what the public accommodations laws are and see if you have any state RIFRA or constitutional protection. And if not, talk to your legislatures and try to get them interested in passing some type of religious uh, freedom restoration act that would help these individuals as they move forward and living their faith through their businesses. Scott Gaylord, thank you very much for being on the Catholic Current today. I'm very grateful. Thank you for having me on the program. Have a great evening. Folks, tomorrow you want to tune in at 5, uh, five o'clock Eastern. And we're going to have Layla Miller address the question, preparing your children to face tough moral issues. I'm Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current. Join us Monday through Friday, 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern. We have a very special show on Friday regarding fake news and Catholic journalism. Don't miss it. Through the intercession of Lady Carmel, may mighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate right through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.